Ladies and gentlemen, we now move into our next panel discussion, which will be led by Elena Freitas, Professor UNESCO Chair. And the topic of conversation is scaling AI and drone innovations for global wildlife management. This conversation will be had with George de la Portes, co-founder and CEO Probotech. Bruno Oberle, President, World Resources Forum and Chair of the Green Digital Finance Alliance. Masamba Thioe, Project Executive, UNFCCC, Global Innovation Hub. Dionysis Kriakopoulos, who is the President of the Institute of A, Greek Ministry of Agriculture. And of course, as you just saw, Marco van der Rie, Founder and CEO, Brokering Solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elena Freitas to manage this conversation. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this session, Tech for All, Scaling AI and Drone Innovations for Global Wildfire Management. This is, of course, a very relevant issue, and um, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to join our insightful discussion with our distinguished panel focused on the use of artificial intelligence and drone technology in combating wildfires worldwide. As climate change escalates the frequency and intensity of wildfires, innovative technological solutions have become crucial in both prevention and management strategies. This solution has been brought up to light through the innovation program Tech for All from Huawei, and it uses a technology-driven approach that includes identifying high-risk areas using climate data, deploying drones for continuous monitoring, gathering detailed on-site information for improved response accuracy, and using AI to predict fire trends and provide rescue and evacuation suggestions. This panel will bring together technology and environmental experts and policy makers to discuss how AI and drone technology can be scaled and adapt to serve as a global solution to the growing wildfire problem reflecting the commitment to using technology for the greater good and environment sustainability. It's indeed a big, a big pleasure for me to moderate this panel, and this is an extremely important risk, and uh, we are in a country that faced, not a long time ago, an important tragedy that we should remember. 2017, we had a, a big tragedy in the center of Portugal due to a, a huge wildfire with a lot of fatalities. And uh, we are, the Portuguese have a very strong and deep perception on the impact of this risk in, in the present and in the future. So this is really important to see, an, I mean, an example of the application of this technology and how far it can really go in assessing I mean, and preventing the risk and at the same time protecting the communities and involving the communities in this, in this prevention of risk. So I think it's, and it's important that this case study that we're going to show uh, happened in Greece, which is a kind of a Mediterranean forest that is very much connected to our forest. We are in the same biome. So it's, uh, in a way, uh, it can, uh, can be uh, an interesting example of a technology that could be applied eventually in our own ecosystem. But of course, I mean, the main goal of this, of this, of this, uh, of this project, this initiative, is really to scale up. And I mean, uh, let's see if it's really, it has potential to go further. So I will ask each of you to introduce ourselves and uh, we start with, the, with um, our Greek panelists and uh, I will start by Mr. Kopoulos. I'm sorry, apologize if I didn't start yeah, it correctly. It's okay. But I will start and I please ask you to start uh, introducing yourself and, uh, and the project, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dionysis Kiriakopoulos. I am the president of the Institute of Agricultural Sciences, which is based in Athens, in Greece. The purpose of the Institute is the assurance of the forest of Sigru Estate, approximately 1,000 acres, placed in an urban area. We are surrounded by homes. Due to this condition, derives the risk of uh, fire and our obligation to preserve this natural source of life. 
In addition, for more than 140 years, the Institute of Agricultural Sciences has been the first institute in Greece which was founded with the purpose of agricultural education. Nowadays, we offer specialized educational seminars for anyone interested in the agricultural field. And we specialize, I have to notice that, in apiculture B, since our institute, the Institute of Agricultural Sciences in Greece, is the only bearer in Greece which provides a professional beekeeper certificate. Thank you very much. Would you like to introduce the project or should we, because I know that you were implementing the project. Okay, then. And uh, Georgios, I uh, don't know if you want to join immediately and uh, maybe, okay, please, please. George? Um, first of all, uh, thank you for this participation. I'm pretty much honored about what is happening here right now. And it's vital for me to be here and assist you and possibly disseminate my position on how we can participate to assist uh, in this problem and alleviate the problem. Um, my name is George Alaportas. I'm the CEO of Probotech. Uh, I'm a computer engineer and computer scientist as well. I have a background in uh, AI security. I'm an IT specialist. And as far as I can remember, uh, lots of experiences in the AI sector. So I used to be the guy who builds computers and AI stuff that you usually see in the movies, but we do them work, especially for the purpose of protecting the environment and, of course, alleviate the problem of the fire. Um, yes, uh, indeed, um, we're in a project. Um, we were actually um, supported by Huawei in Greece. Um, they are actually the ones who discovered our company and told us, well, you know, we have to do something in the CSR prospects. And that's what we did. So we participated and then we joined forces. And then uh, with Mr. Kyrkopoulos there at the Sigru Park, uh, we began testing the first pilot system so that we protect and we find solutions, actually, that we can protect in the future um, the whole uh, era, uh, the whole area uh, regarding the early fire prevention. And um, it was a very challenging uh, project, you know, because fires uh, is not something tangible. It's something very alive. And we used everything that we know of AI, cameras, drones, robotics, automation. And our cooperation so far was very fruitful. We've learned so many things. And that's why we're here today to disseminate again, like I said before, and um, show what we've learned, the lessons that we learned, and of course, uh, possibly to ask and to answer any questions asked by the people um, who want to know how technology can be um, the one of the ways that we can um, participate with people, of course, with the participation of people, of course, towards a more secure future and safe for everybody to live. Would you like to, to show us the, the project itself? Uh, yes, would you like to? Yeah, maybe, because we... So, please. So it seems that we have a different technologies, and um, I, I don't know if you'd like to start by explaining I mean, the, the For sure. complexity of all For this. For sure, Elena. Yes, um, like I said before, it was a very challenging uh, cooperation. It was challenging for us. This never happened, as far as I know, the way that we built the system in the past. Um, we managed to use AI on cameras, on cameras on the ground or on poles. We used the certain drones. Um, we streamed the drone um, image and viewing, the remote viewing uh, over videos to our systems so that we have um, two ways of uh, detecting fires and smoke. Uh, so either with the drones or either with the cameras on the ground, 
We also utilize IoT sensors. Um, specifically speaking, we use, utilize, we use sensors in the IoT sector because we, we need to have um, devices that can cope up with longevity. In other words, they have to live in the forest for many, many years, so we don't have to go back and run, uh, recheck the batteries and so forth. Um, then we also managed to orchestrate the whole system into a one unified platform, what we call the COP, the Common Operational Platform. It was um, essential that we manage all the information gathered either from the sensors or the drones or the people possibly involved in the process, like the firemen, the police officers, or us as a company, so that we can then make decisions, make smarter decisions. You know, there's always human in the loop, but once um, you want to make something easier for people and much more uh, precise for future generations uh, to have as a, as a significant tool, um, you have to take into consideration every single uh, click, every single point of information, and that's what we did. So um, it was all about merging together existing technologies or advancing uh, the current ones, uh, and then building the ecosystem of processes, ecosystem of technologies, ecosystems of solutions to build something better, something more organized, more well-structured, in other words. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to tell you the numbers. Uh, we were actually, we believe at least um, up to today, that we are actually the only ones who ever discovered um, a wildfire in uh, 2.5 minutes. And as you know, there's a golden rule in the European Union. You know, we, we call this the 15 minutes golden rule. So this 15 minutes golden rule, it says that possibly whoever discovers a wildfire in the very first minutes, he or she is able to overcome the issue and possibly uh, put out the fire in the next 10 minutes. So by having a very early precise detection of the fire in the very first minutes, um, we're able to go, and, uh, to go there in the field um, inform uh, the fire brigaders, inform the police, inform all the authorities and put them straight uh, to focus on the fire event. And this is how you solve the issue. This is one of the key things. You know, George, before we jump into the, the questions of the community and local relevance, I was wondering, because I presume you are a small company in Greece and uh, I mean, you had to somehow to engage with all you know Huawei which is of course a very very big company and uh, I mean this is also interesting to I mean to understand how could you you know a small company work with a big company how did you connect and was it a easy dialogue and relationship was it relevant in order to implement this kind of solution true Elena it was a very long process and it still is like you said we're a very small company we're a startup we're an SME so for a smart, uh, for, for a startup company to build something smart and innovative in the process, uh, especially nowadays, it takes a lot of um, uh, work, a lot of um, speaking, a lot of interaction. Um, you have to learn, of course, uh, from the best, from the ones who did things before you. So there's a lot of study, a lot of research in the process again. And um, of course, you'll do mistakes. With, by mistakes, then you learn, uh, with this experience of the mistakes, you learn how to make, the, make things better, and it works better every single time. Um, yeah, it's, um, like I said, it's been a very challenging um, situation, but we think that we've done enough so far, because we didn't just stay in the pilot, we actually achieved and managed to build even more systems that are now past the uh, pilot um, case. So we're actually building the system now that they can protect the future, by engaging into building complete, fully working uh, um, solutions. Thank you, thank you. I think it's uh, also relevant for us to understand, I mean, in terms of, for you as a manager of this big area, I don't know how, how, how big is it, but anyway, it's a, I think it's a park, 1,000 hectares. So I was uh, wondering, I mean, I mean, to involve all this, even, uh, you know, the the administration, I mean, the need, of, the need for capacity building, the involvement of the communities, I, I'm presuming that it must have been also challenging for you. I don't know if you'd like to share with us. Uh... It, it is, uh, actually, to, to nowadays. To my mind, to me, uh, when we talk about digital with purpose, it's exactly the case we, we experienced in the Segura State. I will never forget that call. It was uh, from Highway and Probotech telling me that they want, to, they want us, the Segura State, to be the first, the, the pilot, where they will demonstrate what can digital do for our, for, for, for our for people, for us, to prevent us from fire. 
When uh, they appeared to my door, they showed me everything, all you see in that video. I was curious if it's, if it's gonna work. George actually still laughing with my saying, no way. <laughs> but it did, it did, it prevent us. Several uh, uh, incidents happened. Imagine that uh, this uh, census can trace the smoking from, eh, you know, from a cigarette. How little is that? Imagine that we had an incident where an indicator uh, showed us an incident. It was not an incident, of course. It was somebody smoking inside the forest. Yeah. Imagine that. So, uh, I believe that if we have an example is uh, Huawei and Probotech, what, we do, what they did for us. Uh, imagine that in 1981, if I'm right, yes, 19, 1981, we lost 400 acres of forest inside the Segura State because of fire. If we had this system, if this system was installed, I don't believe we would lose no more than 10 acres, five acres, no more than that. So I ring a bell to everybody listening to this. If you want to prevent the, your forest, your personal forest, maybe you have a forest, you got a forest owner, I don't know, because in Greece, for example, some people own little forests. So there is only one way, the way of Huawei and Probotech to install the indicators they, with the 5 AI, eh? don't forget about that, AI and 5G technology, eh? of course. F yes, AI and 5G, 5G network. So you have immediate response to where exactly the incident is. Mm -hmm. The drone goes up, opens the camera, and you see exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. It was magic to me. And I'd like to thank Huawei and Probotech for doing this for the Segura State and letting me sleep overnights of summer in Greece, which is, as you know, is very hot now this, these days. I called my mother-in-law before I come and the temperature is something like 40 mm -hmm. degrees of Celsius. Yeah. So and you I'll, can imagine the danger. We'll, we'll, I think we'll have time to, to come back to your case, which is, I think it's uh, very, very relevant, of course. But as we, let's try to see if would, would it be possible to go for another kind of forest. So there's the tropical forest and we have Marco with us in Brazil, in the Amazon. Marco, please introduce yourself yeah. and uh, maybe you can share with us some thoughts on this, what could be the potential of this technology, for example, in the kind of forest that you are dealing with. Thank you, Elena. Yeah, my name is Marco van der Rey. I'm from my organization is Brokering Solidarity. I work with uh, multiple partners on accelerating uh, solutions uh, a lot in Brazil with forest issues. Uh, and my background is uh, uh, as a political scientist working on, uh, on biodiversity policy already since the, the mid 90s and always worked in sustainable development uh, issues and organizations for the last 30 years. Um, I talked already about uh, indigenous lands and, and, and I think forest prevention there is, is essential as well. In the Cerrado even more than in the Amazon because it's much drier and there's many more fires. It's a bit bigger than 400 uh, hectares, I think a thousand acres. Uh, so uh, it would be interesting to think through how your solutions can help in larger areas. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about another organization I support uh, in Brazil, which is the Black Jaguar Foundation here. Um, because fire prevention in forest restoration and biodiversity restoration is also essential. Even more because you then start investing a lot of money in bringing forest back. Of course, at least first keep the forest we have, but then bring also more forest back. And that's what we, the Black Jaguar Foundation is doing. Um, their main phrase is, it's too late to be a pessimist. Um, and uh, the climate issues and the challenges we see on the, on the planet at the global level are, are tremendous. So um, I think we are, uh, uh, from that perspective, we, we have to act, we have to move, we have to find solutions, we have to scale them, and we have to do them as fast as possible. So we can no longer be a pessimist. Um, and uh, the Black Jagger Foundation uh, intends to uh, restore one million hectares of forest uh, along the Araguaia River. Uh, actually, the, the, the Chavant uh, I, sh I talked about just before is just on a tributary uh, of, this, of this river. 
the river is 2,600 kilometers long, which is from Amsterdam to Athens, of course. Uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is a long way. <laughs> um, and if you would start uh, restoring uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, places along this river uh, within big farms, that's what we're looking at here, uh, uh, in, in the water uh, points, the little streams, the, the sources, uh, which are called uh, areas of permanent protection, uh, uh, and also the legal reserves that the farmers have to keep in, in their territories, which depends on where they are, is 20, 30, 50 or 80 percent of the agricultural property. Uh, we help them restore uh, uh, these pieces of, of land. Um, it's about 1,700 to 2,000 trees per hectare uh, that we have to work on. So if you want to do the 1 million hectares, we are talking about uh, uh, 1.7 billion trees. It's a lot. And it's a lot of effort, and it's costly to do this. If you take uh, uh, the uh, restoration cycle uh, of the Black Dragon Foundation, which has 17 steps, uh, if we do the full cycle and we calculate the cost per tree, and, and that includes fencing to protect uh, cattle to come into the uh, forest, uh, which is very expensive, we, we end up with about 8 euros per tree. So you can imagine the total cost of doing 1 billion hectares. And, and such investment we don't want to lose. So fire prevention is already a, a part of the, of the whole preparatory cycle so that we don't lose uh, uh, little remnants of forest that we have. Uh, and it's also as number three here of the, of the restoration cycle. And it's also part of uh, the, uh, when the forest is grown back after more or less three, four years. Uh, the canopy uh, is, is, is closed at the top and the forest will start rest rest restoring itself. We need to have sort of a permanent monitoring for the long term, uh, 20 years and beyond of the, of the forest to prevent fires. So therefore, uh, thinking through how if we work, we work in an area of eight municipalities, those municipalities in Brazil are big. We have little plots here and there, sometimes two and a half hectares or 10 hectares or 50 or three. Uh, how, how could we on a larger area actually understand to monitor uh, um, the, uh, uh, the fire, fire prevention? So these kind of sensors could potentially be very good and you have a central point where you can capture the information. So um, I wanted to bring this example. So making big investments in order to restore nature and restore forests, uh, how can it be helped by technology uh, that you have developed uh, in, in thinking through larger monetary monitoring systems uh, of, of, this, uh, uh, of this work. So the, the um, avoided cost, if we uh, actually reforce the entire area uh, of, of loss of biodiversity, of loss of water of, uh, of, uh, uh, within this area is 17, 17 billion. So it is really worth it to reforest and restore forest and nature. We create a lot of jobs with it. You can see the big nursery. We have, we produce a half a million uh, uh, trees there per year. We work with local communities, we integrate them, and we put 70, more than 70 species back into those forested areas, having a, creating a real biodiversity, which then becomes even richer after it's, uh, uh, after it's uh, recovered. So that's what I wanted to talk to and, and think through potential solutions of fire prevention, which is really important. Even if you go beyond Brazil, there's big fires in the Pantanal at the moment as well, uh, which is strange because it's a wetland. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess the experiences in Portugal and Greece have shown how, how incredible impact they can have also on human life. Let's yeah. uh, think through preventing for fires in those, those areas or managing fires is another point uh, you might want to have to think through uh, is, is important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for bringing this uh, this topic, which is, uh, yeah, we've been reading in the news. How, how was it possible to have such a big fire in Pantanal, a big wetland? So it's really a, a, a major a major risk for the, for the present and for the future. Uh, we we tend to see this uh, risk, uh, wildfire risk management, as a, a problematic of of rural land of the forest, but of course we can also face it and sometimes uh, very heavily in, in urban, urban areas. And uh, Masamba, you've been uh, working in, in, in urban, urban areas for a long time. Would you like please to bring your perspective on this, on this issue? Mm. Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon to all of you. 
very pleased to be part of this very important uh, panel. My name is Masambo Choi. I'm the project executive of the UN Climate Change Global Innovation Hub, um, an initiative of the UNFCCC Secretariat launched at COP26 in Glasgow. So we have a little bit more than two years and, and a half. So um, science is value neutral, but innovation is not. Innovation has always an agenda. The reality is that to a large extent, innovation has served in the past and continue to serve to a large extent power. Imagine a world be it uh, economic power or military power. And I think the use of AI powered drone is a very good example. It can be used for the worse, it can also be used for the best. Um, we have seen um, what we call AI powered drone. Um, with laser target recognition that are enhancing the accuracy of precise target munition um, that can have very precise strike and a lot of destruction using this cutting edge technology. We have seen also ARM AI powered drone that are uh, equipped with uh, missile and, and bomb, and that can provide, provide very precise strike and also a lot of um, destruction. Now the question is, how can we ensure that this cutting edge technology serves the best and let's say less the worst? Um, maybe starting with um, firefighting, the um, wildfires are very important to address because they impact several elements of the planetary boundaries. They contribute to CO2 emission when the forests burn, we are emitting CO2 but they also destroy the vegetation, which is one of the elements that uh, ensure the removal of CO2. So if you burn a forest, you reduce the capability of the earth to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. It also impacts biodiversity because it is um, leading to loss of biodiversity, as well as degradation of land and soil. So wildfires are extremely important to, to address. And uh, I fully agree with you, and the presentation that was made is extremely illustrative. Uh, AI-powered drone combined with other technology, such as GIS and uh, IoT, can be extremely effective in combating this wildfire. That are, by the way, a natural part of our ecosystem. But what is happening is that uh, their uh, frequency, their intensity, and the, stake, and the scale of their damage has exponentially increased due to human activities and climate change. But normally, wildfires are part of uh, the natural eco ecosystem. Now, um, if we know that there are solutions that can help address this uh, challenge, but that can also be used for the worse, what needs to be done so that this cutting-edge technology are um, 
can be scaled up to support climate and sustainability, can be upscale to support the many people and the planet. For that, the most important thing is to have right at the beginning the innovation designed with purpose. So it has to be designed to serve at the first place the needs of the many people and the needs of the planet. This is what we are calling a human-centric innovation. An innovation that is not sector-based, problem-oriented and uh, incremental, but an innovation that is more a need-based, based on the needs of the many people and the planet, that is vision-driven. This is how I understand the digital with purpose. It's vision-driven. There is a vision behind. It's not just that you develop a solution and you look for use case, like it is most of the time the case now, or an innovation that is reactive to solve a specific problem. But it's more uh, starting from a vision, a future that we would like to build, and backcasting to translate this vision into needs in terms of climate and sustainability innovation. And if we have this approach, then the innovative solution that we develop will, of course, focus on the needs of the many people and the planet, because by design, they have been developed for that, and they will be easier to upscale, particularly if they are combined with innovative policy instruments, innovative financial instruments, innovative business model, innovative cooperative approach, and innovative product from the culture and creative industry. Because technology innovation alone will not suffice to address the challenge that the planet is facing. We need to have a more integrated approach where all these different um, innovative solutions are combined to serve um, the many people. And um, maybe just to conclude with um, the case of cities that you have mentioned, all these digital technologies are extremely relevant for cities. And to illustrate that, I just would like to provide one example. Cities is the place where the most transformative type of climate and sustainability action can actually happen. Currently, when we are talking about uh, sustainability in city, most of the time we take a sectoral approach, transport sector, building sector, and we try to see what could be done to improve. In the transport sector, most of the time the focus is on how can we shift from combustion car to electric vehicle. This is good, it has to be done, but we need to be mindful that this type of change are only incremental. This is not enough transformative. To have the innovative, transformative uh, solution, we need to ask the question, why do we need car at the first place? Because shifting from combustion car to electric vehicle is good, but having less car is even better. And then we can say we need car because of mobility. Then the next question is, can innovation be used to uh, achieve the need for mobility with less car? So for example, by using um, uh, GIS, this technology from space, and um, by using drone remote sensing, to do land use planning and site selection and build a 15-minute cities where most of the product and services are available at walking and biking distance. And by doing so, uh, you disrupt the need for motorized transportation. Back to you. So I would like to highlight two, two, two things that you mentioned. One, one is that, of course, I'm just going back to to wildfires, 
it is certain that wildfires, fires in general, are part of the ecosystem. Fires are natural events in the dynamic of an ecosystem. But it is clear, as you said, that um, we expect uh, 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 fires to become more intensive and more frequent. And of course, with climate change scenarios, this is going, of course, to be a major issue. And 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 communities in general perceive that this is a, this is a fact. So the, this is a, a risk for most of the communities worldwide. On the other hand, I would like to highlight one of the, you mentioned as well, that um, we, solutions should be, I mean, more and more, this kind of innovative solution should be societal needs driven, so we should, as much as possible, respond to societal needs. And, uh, and that's very complex, as you, uh, as you know, and I was, that's why I was um, asking, I would like to ask Bruno, that was involved in a lot of policy-making, a lot of... Uh, international frameworks and um, exactly discussing the complexity of, of, of organizing and, and designing solutions that are needed for society. So involving involving the companies in response, in the response, in uh, actively responding to these problems. And um, I would ask you, uh, please, to give our your perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, for the flowers action. My name is Bruno Obel, I'm Swiss, I'm Italian. Um, I'm an economist and a naturalist, and I have worked at the crossroad between uh, um, development and environment all my life from different perspectives. I don't go into the detail. Um, what I don't understand anything about drones. I don't have any clue about artificial intelligence and I know very few about fires. So, but I am, I have a certain insight into risk management. When I was the state secretary in Switzerland for environment, basically as the minister for environment, I was responsible for biodiversity, technical pollution, uh, for climate, uh, for forests, but also for natural hazards and industrial hazards. And when I was a professor at the Swiss Federation of Technology, I was, among others, the academic director of the International uh, Risk uh, Governance Center. So I will look at this question from the risk management perspective. And uh, um, because uh, digital with purpose, logically I will be more on the P than on the D. Uh, so I will look more on the purpose of this, of this technology, technology here. So, well, is fire a risk? Well, it is not. Fire per se exists on this planet, has always existed. Forests burn from time to time. Even Arctic forests burn from time to time. In Switzerland, less than in Spain, Portugal, or Greece, we have problem with water. We have floats. But also this, I mean, rain, water flows from up the mountain, um, mountain until the sea. Always did. And this is per se not a risk. So the risk is created when humans, when we are, put an asset there. Uh, would put an asset where it could burn together with the forest, or it could be washed away by, by the water, by extreme, by extreme rains events. So this is the first thing that we have to keep in mind. So we are managing the consequences of human actions. So, uh, and uh, the, let's say, the way to, to manage risk is more or less always the same. You look the first look you have, it is an economic one. You have growing costs of the events. The bigger the flood is, the bigger the fire is, the more damages you have. Because you have a lot of asset there. And to, to, to protect, to prevent, you can spend more and more. And you have a point of optimization of the system, where you invest exactly so much money in the prevention to avoid an additional amount of, of, of destruction. So this is the technocratic approach to that. Uh, 
Um, and drones may reduce the costs because you don't have to be present, boots on, on the ground, because you are quicker, you can you use less wa water, you, do, you use smaller groups of firemen because you are quicker there, and you will explain me because, as I've said, I'm not a specialist of fire. Um, so this is, this is one aspect of this technology. It, 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 it takes the, 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 the damages down and reduces the costs. We have another category of, of reasons why you want to manage further risk if you have some veto condition. So if, if, you, if the condition is we don't want this highway to be destroyed, to be destroyed by the float, so then you may go further simply because it is a, for the country it's a strategic asset that this highway have to be open and then you invest more money in fighting against float, floats or fires to keep it open. Or, or if you have a political decision that you want, you want casualties, so you, you invest as far that you can protect everyone. Or you oblige people to move away um, in a place where they are not a danger. And this is the only, the only let's say, um, like this agreement that I have with this approach that have to be social dri driven, yes, but the society has also to adapt and, and be driven by the risk. So you can move people because they are at the wrong, at the wrong place in a specific situation. But th this, is the, this is the management, this setting, I would look at this, uh, at this, uh, at this drones history. Now, the question is how many other solutions do we have? Uh, so the, 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 the traditional one, um, we, may, we may reflect on solutions that are more relating um, relying on, 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 natural, on natural elements. For example, um, I have decided several times in Switzerland to make the river bigger uh, because the water flows can go without less damages around. And so what it means basically moving the people pushing the, the people away from the place where the danger is. So this could be a solution. I don't know the specific situation. If you say it is nearby a city, it's probably difficult to move a city, but the, moving a, a village is possible. So it, to, to put the village in a place where there is, a, there is, there is the danger is, uh, is, uh, is lower. And this in the long term is the better solution than having super drones that observe everything because it it solves the problem at the, at the roots. No? It, you eliminate simply the risk. Another approach could be also based on nature to have kind of flora um, that is more resistant to, uh, to, uh, to fires. Um, this is, I mean, it, I, I, I imagine you have it so you, you, don't, log, you, you don't let grow high high uh, trees nearby the houses. You ask the, 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 the house uh, owner to, to have to have smaller plants, so then even if the fire is coming, you, it will not be a big fire because it is less biomass that can be moved. But having used all this natural-based solution, giving space, taking biomass away that can burn, drones at one moment can be a very good additional additional item. So this is the way to think if you are responsible to manage this type of thing. In my case, it was more at the political level and not at the practical level. And then, of course, at the political level, you have to take the, the, the political regulations to, to allow these things to happen, to give money, to allow authority to move people and so on. Uh, so thank you so uh, much. Thank you, thank you, Bruno. One of the aspects that I would like actually to, to bring up is uh, this, this the application of this technology um, highlights the need to invest. One of the big discussions we have in Europe regarding the wildfire risk is, um, is in a, you know, the investment that has been essentially done in, 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 in fighting fires, like a battle. We have this uh, wildfire issue like is like a battle, especially for the Mediterranean countries and uh, and so it's a lot of investment in uh, in, in, in uh, equipment to to fight the fire this really we are talking about I mean hundreds of millions and uh, uh, there's always always this ambition to go in 
into prevention instead of investing in, 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 in fighting, which of course is a waste of money and a waste of nature, most of it. And, and uh, so I was uh, thinking that in, in a way this is also a way to go, to switch from, from, from a, um, uh, an investment in, in fighting system, or should be, and, and go into the prevention. So, but of course, uh, to, to have this perception in, in, at, the, at the political level and at the very high level, you need to show that is possible, that is, you can scale it up. And that's what, from the point of view of an SME, that, uh, that's, uh, if you were asked to, you know, to scale up at the country level this, this experiment that you have, this pilot, would it be, I mean, what, what, where do you imagine that you'll have the, I mean, mo the most of the obstacles to, to go to scale up at the national level, to have a kind of a monitoring program to prevent wildfires, something like that? What do you say? Well, um, in, the, in the past, the notion that um, you had to be post-active was the norm, you know. But nowadays we see that with technology, with AI, with uh, the advent of even more new technologies that we're going to be seeing in the next few years, being pre-active is the, is the new norm. Is the idea that we have to hunk hard and that we have to be strong in that direction. So, um, definitely, for every new innovative change, you tend to have new obstacles because the old market, the old ways are there and they want to, to still be there. Okay, so um, my, my, my idea is, my perspective is that we have to invest in educating people. Um, even us as a company, whatever we do, we have to educate how our clients perceive um, the past and the future. So in, from this point of view, uh, monitoring, of course, is an essential solution. It's a must, period. And it has to happen because you are pre-active. It's like you're not post-active again. Um, but still, just because there is, there's a huge market there um, and you have to coexist with the old-fashioned ways, let's call it this way, and you have to, pre to present something new, the only way for both sides to survive is to join forces, cooperate, and start extending whatever is there to become something better in the future. Um, and this is not an easy, easy thing to do. Uh, the challenges are a lot, and um, the idea and the process of how you do that it's something not um, very crystal clear to me. And I don't believe that any of us have a very crystal idea of how this will push forward down the road. Um, all I can say, though, is um, we invest in technology because we see how and why the future um, want to be... We want the future to be better uh, from, from, many, uh, from many perspectives. Um, so if you don't invest in the, either if it's post-active or pre-active, that's not the point. The point is that you, you have to survive. And the survival of our race, the survival of our, of our future for our kids uh, and their kids as well, um, is all about protecting the environment, doing things now before it's too late. Although the physicists and the science, the environmentalists say that it's too late. And interrupt you, but did you feel that the community embraced this solution as a reliable solution for the future? Did you have to, to implement some educational programs involving communities? Hello? One, two? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, my second job, let's say, is an adult, adult educator. So, as adults are watching us, I would uh, like to perform my lesson. My lesson talks about atomiti eftini. It's the personal responsibility. Nobody, nobody in the world can teach you what not to do in order not to set up fire. You see, anybody, anybody can light up a fire. What we do, what we must do in order to prevent or to train people how, for example, to evacuate a building. Huh? It's a training process. And secondly, apart from making, as you said, the seminars or the lectures or whatever, first of all is humans. If we humans understand what we don't and do have to do to prevent the floods, the fires, the professor said, 
100% right. You can't build a house in front of a river. It's going to flood. It's going to go away. Big fires in Greece happened. Many people, unfortunately, lost. It was not good for nobody. Nobody. Nobody was proud of that. But what can you do? The only way, the only path, is atomiki efthini. It's our personal responsibility to prevent us, our, ch our children, and the planet from what has happened, as Professor said, right? From our bad use of this planet. But do you feel that now with this technology, with this tool that uh, community perceive that it's available and it is working, do you feel that this somehow allowed community reconnect with the forest? Because I mean, and instead of having it as a as a threat, is it now? Uh, mean more than not 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 a threat, but something that they can touch, they can really embrace. Do you think that is change it the way how people really approach the forest and use the forest? Of course, of course, we need technology. Of course, we need the digital with purpose. As I said, let's create something that's going to prevent fire from either, from not even to start. As you saw in the video, in the first five minutes, three minutes, two minutes, we have a very close look of what is happening, so we can act accord accordingly. So, if, as uh, Jose Laporta said, we can combine the old, the old measures with the new digital, with purpose, uh, uh, yeah. inventions, so of course, we can prevent fires 100%. That's it, no other way. Just as a, as a, I mean, as a researcher, I was also wondering if you feel that there is uh, some research needs, or do you, did you did you involve the scientific community as well in the? Is do you need a kind of a, I mean, an interdisciplinary cluster in order to provide these kind of solutions, or is it enough to have uh, this, you know, this relationship in between your company and and Hawaii? Uh, what could you say in that in that in that respect? The answer is uh, absolutely yes. We don't know everything. We're a company. We're not um, um, experts or specialists, in, of course, in the wildfires or environmentalists, as I said in the past. Um, so we, we had to use the brains uh, from uh, people who are experts in this field. Mm -hmm. And yes, for that, it's, um, it's a multidisciplinary um, uh, field. Uh, too, many, too many people uh, have to work together. Uh, biologists, um, environmentalists, uh, weather scientists, uh, of course, IT teams, IT guys. I mean, um, so we 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 have to work together to correlate our resources, to work on a plan. Uh, of course, there are studies. We did also studies. Every time we do something, we do a study beforehand in order to be more precise on what what sensors we have to use, how to use them, if we need drones, if we don't need drones, how to use the AI, so and so forth. Um, therefore, um, it's, a, it's a complex scenario, but one of the uh, views that we have, uh, the, the perspective is that how we can make this a framework easy for more people to understand and even more easier to implement mm -hmm. so that we provide this to the, uh, to the people in the future. Thank you. I don't know, we are just about to end our session. I would like to give the chance to Marco, Masamba, and uh, Bruno to please to, I don't know if you'd like to add something. Yeah. Well, I, th I think one of the, uh, the most important lessons, I think, and, and uh, as I said, the lemma is it's too late to be a pessimist, uh, but there are solutions. Uh, there are many solutions. Drawdown, for example, shows, the Drawdown report shows many different solutions, how we can tackle the climate. Uh, uh, issues head on, they are available, so let's, and I think that's what we we, sh we see here at Digital with Purpose as well, let's take the solutions that work and scale them as fast as we can. That's, that's what we have to do. So we have to work not only on the innovation side, the innovation has to be human as well, as Masamba said, but we also have to very much bring in the financial sector and, and start funding the solutions that are scalable rapidly. And I think that is where we have to uh, focus our attention on. Absolutely. Thank you, Marco. Masamba, please. Yeah, I would like to come back to the preventive solution yes. that you have mentioned. 
I think we need to act on two aspects. We can leverage uh, technology such as predictive AI and machine learning model so that we use data and identify pattern as well as anomalies that are impeding future issue so that we can anticipate. But more importantly, and I really insist on that aspect that you have mentioned, we need also to reinvent ourselves. We need to change our way of thinking, our way of acting on and interacting with nature. That's really important and we need to promote the widespread adoption of these three core values that we are promoting everywhere. Caring, meaning caring, genuinely caring for the planet and its inhabitants. Sharing, joining resources to address this type of issue. And daring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masawa. Bruno, please. Maybe, maybe it's strange for someone like me that is an economist and have studied in a technical university but uh, um, I think technology is important, finance is important. At the end, what it is, what it makes the decision is politics. It's the capacity of a community to come together to discuss and agree on solutions that are good for the further development of the, of the whole. In this sense, what we have seen in the, in the previous session, these people in Brazil below a tree reflecting what is the best for their community. So politics is, at the end of the day, the way of hope. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you in this session, and thank you for, for all of you. Yeah.